And I'm not going to read the yeah, thank rest you. of the author's <laughs> list. Yes. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Arnab from Eastern Labs. And yeah, perhaps this is the paper with the most number of authors in this conference. And uh, well, historically, we were all at Novi Research when this work took place. And I see some of my co-authors here, Lera from A16Z. Uh, Mahimna, are you here? Uh, he's from Cornell and a bunch of other people. All right. So yeah, so what is strobe? Uh, it's a random beacon. What is a random beacon? Uh, it's a continuously operating application which outputs a random value at regular intervals. Okay, so strobe is one of these random beacons, and uh, there are some interesting properties about strobe that I'll talk about in this talk. All right, so random beacons as a whole, they have a lot of applications, right? So gaming, for example. Like you want to uh, shuffle a deck of cards, roll some dice, all of that is randomness. Uh, it, it's got use in marketing, uh, sampling, like you want to send uh, promotional material to a bunch of random users, um, leader election in consensus, and so on. So it's very important, uh, especially in a blockchain setting. Uh, so a random beacon must have some security and quality features. Uh, most importantly, unpredictability. So for example, you don't want that turning up uh, on your opponent's cards uh, quite often, right? Uh, although you would like that, a straight flush. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we want uh, these random coin tosses to be truly random, uh, or at least pseudo-random, so that you know this doesn't occur too frequently. Uh, unbiased. Uh, especially in blockchain setting. So no individual or coalition should be able to bias the outcome of the uh, output, especially where you know uh, huge values of transactions are involved. Liveness, uh, the protocol should ensure outputs at regular intervals. And verifiability, especially again in blockchain setting where uh, you, know, you want public validation of these, very, uh, of these uh, random outputs, especially. Uh, public validators, for example. Okay, uh, so to give a very standard example, uh, threshold BLS is an example of a random beacon. So uh, at a very high level, what threshold BLS does is uh, it observes that BLS signatures is unpredictable. Nobody should be able to output a BLS signature on a message uh, if they don't know the secret key. Uh, so uh, and it turns out that BLS is uh, easily thresholdizable because of its algebraic structure. So what the threshold BLS, for example, DRAND, uh, they do is that uh, there is a distributed key generation phase where no single party is given a secret key, but shares of the secret key. And uh, the idea is that T out of, the, uh, out of N, where T and N some, are some parameters, they should be able to reconstruct a BLS uh, signature uh, given a uh, sufficient number of them. Okay, so the idea is that in the beacon phase, you know, uh, essentially uh, the beacon output is a signature on the particular timestamp of that output. It could be a block number, for example. So, so you would output hash of one to the power SK, where SK is the BLS signature key. Uh, hash of two to the power sk, hash of t to the power sk for time t, and so on. So that is the uh, beacon's output. And you can apply additional random oracles on top of this to make it pseudo-random. OK, so what, what uh, does this have the properties that we talked about? Uh, it's unpredictable because it's based on the unforgeability of signatures. So we already know that BLS is a, an unforgeable uh, signature scheme, so that means that nobody should be able to predict the output of uh, these hash, uh, these uh, signatures, uh, especially less than t colluders. So, uh, so th that's why it should be unpredictable. Uh, it's live based on the availability of at most t of, t of n parties. So that's why this threshold setting makes sense. Like a threshold of the parties should be able to reconstruct. Uh, the random output at regular intervals. And verifiability is easy because it's a signature scheme. You have you can have a public key of the signature scheme itself, which can verify the final public output. Okay, 
So uh, this is in a nutshell threshold BLS. Now we observe that you know, it would be good to have an, an extra property that threshold BLS uh, doesn't have. In particular, we cannot determine past values of the beacon by just looking at the current value. What does that mean? So if you look at the uh, random beacon output at epoch 2, which is hash of 2 to the power sk, you cannot predict just by looking at that what hash of 1 to the power sk would be. Right? So we call this property history generation. Threshold BLS does not achieve that, easily at least. And what strobe does is achieving this property. Otherwise, strobe has many structural similarities with threshold BLS. Okay, so this is the challenge, or at least the main one. Okay, so why is this property useful? Uh, it gives immediately some streaming ca capabilities uh, if you have history generation. So users, let's say you have a very dodgy internet connection somewhere, right? Uh, and uh, this beacon is operating at a very fast speed. What could happen is that you lose some packets, you don't know what the intermediate values were, right? So with history generation, what you can do is like, you know, even if you get the values of these packets at some intervals, you can reconstruct the past values, okay? And that can be immediately useful in many situations. It also gives you storage efficiency. So it's, uh, if you had a threshold VLS kind of setting, like where, uh, you know, uh, it's not possible to history generate, then you would have to store all the random values if you wanted to just look them up. You did not have a internet connection. But now with history generation, you can just keep some of these values. Or even if, if, if you want, you can just keep one value and generate everything else. But you can do some amortization here. So you can keep values at some regular intervals and just reconstruct the past values from those. Okay, so this allows efficient recall and storage. All right, so how do we build this? So to build this, we look at uh, the Beaverso random beacon from 1993. So this was based on RSA groups. So just to recall, uh, RSA is based on product of very large primes, and it's based on uh, the intractability of finding the order of uh, such groups, uh, given that factoring is hard, okay? So in, in particular, the order of an RSA group is phi of n, which is p minus one times q minus one. Uh, if, if somebody knows the order of the group, they can do certain things very easily. If, if you don't know the order of the group, certain things are hard, okay? So in particular, we use the fact that, the beaver so random we can use is the fact that if we just know this product of these, the, the, the composite order, but not the components, then squaring is easy. So if you have a random value x, then you can keep squaring them, x, x squared, x to the four, and so on. Is that a random beacon? It's not, because you can predict these values, right? So it's not unpredictable in the future. But square rooting is hard. So going from x to square root of x to the fourth root of x and so on. This is now unpredictable. Because given x, it's hard to predict what square root of x is, right? But now, uh, how do we compute this? That is the question, right? So now let's consider a simple setting where there is actually a dealer, okay? A trusted dealer. So what the dealer does is that it knows uh, the factoring and it chooses this random seed x and it computes, it, there, is a, there is a fixed t that is given to it, capital T. What it does is that it chooses this random x and computes x to the 2 to the t, okay? And then the dealer outputs this in reverse. So this is, this may be re reminiscent of like, you know, hashing in reverse, okay? So you output the final value, x to the 2 to the t, and then in each round, you go back, right? Because you, and you can do that because, uh, the dealer can do that because they, they computed this and stored this in advance, okay? Uh, and uh, so nobody else can predict the next round's output because this is essentially, uh, you know, square rooting 
uh, in each round. Um, and I actually misspoke. The dealer does not have to know the factoring of uh, n here in order to do this, because they, they already did it in, uh, in offline, right? But they have to know in advance this capital T, and uh, you expect the, a common dealer to do this. Okay, so so what is what is the good property of this sequence? Anybody can just verify that you know it is the correct sequence because what is the reverse of the sequence? It's just squares. All right, so anybody can uh, verify, but nobody can predict the uh, next epochs output. All right, so this means once the first round value is produced x, the dealer can't cheat, okay? And it's unpredictable. Okay, so yes, it is verifiable. Uh, it's to some extent unbiased because, you know, once the seed value is fixed, the whole beacon stream is fixed. And of course, uh, there's a caveat we need to trust the dealer to not bias the seed. Uh, it is unpredictable based on the hardness of RSA. Uh, liveness is weak because it depends on the dealer not breaking down, but uh, we can solve this using this, uh, you know, dis distributing this computation. Uh, one big problem is that this can only progress for a fixed number of rounds, right? Because uh, if you looked at the protocol, the dealer has to fix this sequence for some fixed capital G, right? So you have to, the dealer has to, this is kind of, uh, epoch bound, how, how many times it can do this. And also, if, depending on the value of t, this, this sequence can be very, very large, right? So we need to solve this problem. So strobe resolves this perpetuality problem. We call this per perpetuality problem, which is that we should be able to go on indefinitely, at least for an exponential time. Uh, uh, and Doing that, it introduces history generation of a future for perpetual random beacons like threshold PLS. Okay, so how do we do this? So this is the key insight. So instead of square rooting, you pick any prime u that is greater than two, and observe that any entity. So you can do the same thing here. So any entity which knows u inverse can compute u -th roots. And any public entity which knows u can verify backwards, right? And this can continue indefinitely. Uh, now some housekeeping. Uh, so how do we make sure the setup generator does not cheat, make it distributed? The protocol does not stop if the dealer fails. Again, make it distributed. So a threshold distributed setting can address both problems. So we fix a TN and N, just like in threshold PLS. And uh, then less than t number of parties colluding cannot reconstruct. Uh, if more than or equal to t parties uh, remain live, they can reconstruct. Uh, and the trusted setup, we can use an uh, MPC protocol to generate n and u. Uh, I will not talk about this part. OK, so now uh, let's look at how we can construct a simple protocol uh, in a simpler setting, which is that we, we have t equals n. So n parties can reconstruct. Any less than n minus n, n parties cannot reconstruct. So what, how can we do this in this setting? So what we can do is this secret share, this s, which is u inverse in our case, <coughs> among all the n nodes, right? So so this S is split as S1 plus S2 plus so on, mod phi n among n nodes, right? Now, observe that S is actually unpredictable to any n minus one of these nodes, right? Because the leftover part is uh, totally random, okay? So given this setting, how do we uh, output the random beacon? We start with the X, uh, the seed at the beginning. Okay, this x goes to all the n parties, right? So now each party takes x, which is the current beacon output, raises them to the power of the share that they have. So x to the s1, x to the s2, so on till x to the sn. Okay? When you combine them, like just multiply them up, you get x to the power s because, you know, s is the sum of all these shares. 
do the same process again. So take this x to the s, raise them to the individual powers, and then keep doing that, all right? And now observe that the shares themselves can be checked against the share in the previous round. So it's not only the final beacon output, but each share. So this, uh, this helps, you know, even share verification you can do by this history generating feature or history verifying feature. Yeah, go ahead. Three minutes. Three minutes, okay. <laughs> I thought you had a question, all right. All right, so uh, yeah, so this is a pretty unique property of strobe versus other beacons, which is inherited from Viverso. Um, and we can easily check that xt to the power u is xt minus one for any beacon output. In fact, we can compute all previous values with reasonable efficiency, okay, given our current value. Uh, so that was the n minus one of n threshold setting, but we adapt this to k of n threshold setting. Now this is not as easy as uh, threshold BLS, because in threshold BLS we have a prime order setting, whereas this is composite order. Uh, and a challenge that we have is that when you do Lagrange interpolation, you have to do fractional exponents, right? And that is easy for prime order settings. For composite orders, we have to do something else because we cannot compute these roots. Essentially, these fractions are roots uh, uh, for, for RS exponentiation. So what you do is instead compute this n factorial F0 instead of just F0, okay? And with n factorial in the exponent, you can, uh, you can compute everything as an integer. So, so there is some amount of uh, mathematical manipulation to make sure this works out correct, uh, as well as you know satisfy security. Uh, so that was the construction, and uh, we uh, let's not talk about the formal security model. Uh, and I'll go through this quickly, I guess. Uh, so, so there is a challenger and adversary. The challenger generates a PQ. Uh, and also a prime u. And then the adversary outputs uh, a value, an epoch number basically, capital S, that I, I, want to I want to attack this particular epoch. And it also outputs uh, uh, a few of the parties that it wants to corrupt. So P1 through PT1 minus one. And then uh, the challenger outputs uh, random x. It also gives the values of the beacon output up to epoch S. And also uh, shear values, I think, yeah. And then uh, the adversary wins if they can output the next epochs random value, okay? And we prove that strobe is actually secure in this model, uh, given that the RSA problem is hard. Okay, so um, that's about uh, the strobe random beacon. So uh, it satisfies uh, you know, all the nice properties about random beacons, which is unpredictable, unbiased, live, verifiable, perpetual. And it also has this interesting history generating property. So, yeah, yeah thank you. Now it's time for questions. Um, so, the, uh, I have two questions. The first question is, uh, how do they go backwards? So given x cubed, how is an individual supposed to obtain x squared? Uh, so so given x cubed, you do not... Oh, sorry, x... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry, x to the u cubed. Yeah, x cubed, x. x to the 9, x to the 2. Yeah, exactly. So, so how are they able to obtain the, the pre-image without... And knowing the inverse? Yeah, so so let's say you you the current beacon output, output is um, x cubed, right? The, then the previous beacon output was actually x to the 9. So oh, you can oh, check. Okay, I'm sorry. But you cannot compute. Like from x to the 9, you cannot go to x cubed. Yes. Okay. That's what you do in the distributed protocol. But the other way around, you can verify easily. Yes. Uh, and then the second question I had was, yeah. it seems like the trick of giving like x cubed and then x and, and so on, mm -hmm. uh, can also work over a group of unknown order. And so uh, if the parties have to come together anyways to produce this yeah. next element, why not just have the parties come together to produce one power of some x? So x, x cubed, 
and then just mm -hmm. use a group of unknown order instead. Like yeah, the class group, so, for example. That way we can remove the trusted setup. Right, right, right. So it doesn't work for um, a general group of unknown order because you have to generate the secret shares knowing the trapdoor. Oh, no, sorry. I meant the scheme where it goes from X cubed to X. Yeah. Like uh, where, you know, I sample X ahead of time and then I calculate all the successive powers and then I release the successive powers backwards. Oh, oh yeah. So that the Beaverso protocol, that can be done uh, for groups of unknown order. So then You're correct. Is, but yes. this protocol cannot be done. Yeah. So then why not instead just have the parties come together to, you know, do an MPC to produce those powers just like one ahead of time? Oh, I see. I see. Because so, every step these mm -hmm. parties have to come together anyway. So why not just have them produce? But one then step? That, that's uh, an intractable problem, right? For a group of unknown order oh, doing okay. this cube routing. Okay. And so, yeah. Sorry. Oh, no, sorry. I meant. No, doing x to x cubed. And x to x cubed is uh, is efficient. Yeah, yeah. So anybody but, can do that. Yeah, but they they release. But the x reverse cubed. is reverse is hard in an uh, in a group in a general group of our unknown order. Okay, maybe I'll have this question off. Right? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> generally speaking, also here, the key setup is much more expensive than the operation here, and they mm -hmm. don't really come together. Somebody sends a message to all and collects answers. But maybe we talk later. Yeah. Okay. Why don't you uh, start to build up? And while you do that, because you're the next speaker as well, I have a comment that the mechanism without the distribution, mm -hmm. I saw that in an early paper on key regression, so-called key see. regression for lazy revocation in file systems. Okay, okay. Kevin Fu said Ara and others, and we had mm -hmm. a follow-up paper on this. So this is so the, the idea that going forward and backward in RSA kind of things is uh, has this feature, right? Yeah. I see, I'll, I see. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll, uh, yeah, yeah, please send me the link. I'd love to know. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs>